Okay, so I'm going to start. Um, okay, you can all see me in here. I'm on a crate here, yeah, so let's hopefully not one fall off here. Yeah. Okay, so welcome everyone. Today we're going to be doing very a sim very similar exercise we did uh, to yesterday, except the difference is obviously we're going to be doing Java and also Spring. Um, the concepts are very similar, and if I do go ahead. Where the content is available online, though. so we're going to be using the official Spring guides for the content as such. Though, so if you do feel a little bit uh, lost, you'll have that material. So the first thing that we're going to actually do is get a feel for the room's um, knowledge of Java and Spring. Here. So yes, sir, we did have a one Java developer. So anyone here is a Java developer? Hands up, or has used Java before? Okay, C sharp, or were you all used to guess that? Okay, so Java is like an old version of C sharp, basically. Um, we actually like an old version of C plus um, plus. So the, we're not going to go through the language as such, though. You can actually do. Uh, you can ask uh, my colleagues and I uh, a few language questions as such, though. But we're not going to go through the language. Another thing that we're going to briefly go over is Maven. So Maven is very similar to the build tool that you used yesterday called NuGet. Maven is a lifecycle manager, and we're going to uh, download the default Maven files to allow you to not have to worry about that and then to, to hack them as such. Okay, so on your desktop, the first thing that you, you should notice is that most of you should, if not, we uh, will assist you, have a folder called UFC Spring Training. So, a folder called UFC Spring Training. So, I prepared everything uh, up front, and you have everything that you should need in that folder, UFC Spring folder. If you don't have this folder, please raise your hand, and my lovely colleague will assist you in cloning that. Um, the clone command for this command is that, so you're going to have to git clone that. Git clone and the URL you can all see that there. I'll make it a little bit bigger. Is GitHub.com, my awesome name, Rory P, and then UFC Spring Training. And everything that you need for this these sessions is going to be located on that repo, including a presentation I did at DevConf, uh, which is the uh, largest developer community um, conference around getting started with that. We're going to do a little bit more of a, a basic approach to that. Okay, so you've got that folder there, and you should, it's a little bit small here, you should have now four folders for the labs we're going to go through, um, and also a PDF document and a readme.md. So uh, Markdown is a, uh, was a standard for GitHub, um, and in that MD file, you can actually access it online from the site. So, uh, if you go onto the website, so uh, let's go http colon github uh, github.com. Let me just move this chair here for a sec. Github.com forward slash Rory P forward slash UFS training. Now, UFS Spring uh, Training. So this is the the repo. Um, if you don't know Git, please tonight go and start learning Git. It is the standard tool for distributed systems and source control. And then you see there that it renders it quite nicely on GitHub. And these are GitHub. This is a GitHub style. So GitHub can you can take your markdown and can actually render it in HTML, which is very nice. Um, so we're going to go through this first, and then we're going to give an introduction to what we're going to try and achieve. So we have three labs you're going to do with our assistants. The first exercise we're going to do together, and we're going to go through it and talk through it. So that's going to take us about 45 minutes, and we're going to talk through some of the concepts to familiarize yourself, make sure all your environments are up, and, and make sure that you can actually achieve uh, the outcomes. So let's actually see and just confirm 
everyone's installs are running. So the first thing you want to check is that you have Java installed. Um, and Java, actually, you can check this. You have command line access, but in your terminal there, uh, on your VS Code, you should be able to type Java from the command line. So I'm going to go uh, view, integrated terminal, and I should be able to just go Java, and you can do dash dash version, version, and I, oh, okay, dash version, dash version, and I'll actually get the version of Java. You should all have Java 1.8 installed. So that's just checking that you have Java 8 installed, and we're going to get install Visual Studio Code with the Java extension packs. Because out of the box, what we saw yesterday is that does Visual Studio Code come with the C Sharp extension? No, and then we uh, install it. So we're going to see if it's installed. If it's not installed, then we're going to install it for you. So Java's installed there. And the second thing you want to check is that Maven is installed. So you're going to type in MVN. And you'll, you'll learn to, to hate Maven. Um, and M Maven basically can run off the command line. If it isn't, please call my lovely colleague and they will assist you. And Maven basically will just say, uh, I can't run, but it can execute. This is important for us to understand that your actual environment is in a working copy. So the first thing that we checked on the integrated terminal, I went to uh, view integrated terminal, and then I typed in Java, Java, Java dash version, tells me the version. And then I've got Maven, and I can just type in MVN. You can also go MVN dash version. And it will give me the version of Maven also. Okay, so Java is the same as uh, the CLR command, and Maven is the de facto build tool for Java. Okay, so if you're having <coughs> issues, raise your hand and someone will come to help you. So now that we've ascertained that Maven and Java is working, we now want to use Visual Studio Code for our Java development. And Visual Studio Code is a awesome code editor tool, because what it does is, and what we saw yesterday, um, it actually takes your language server that you want to execute your language in and has an off process process, <laughs> off process process that executes your code. You think that your, uh, Visual Studio is actually doing your compilation and your execution? It's not. It's like Notepad. And it's running it actually off process. So if I go into Visual Studio and I've got all of the plugins installed and I open a file there, so I've got hello controller.java and I click on here, you'll see right at the bottom, it's a bit small there, there is a language server and it says, hey, I know that you're Java now. And I did that by just telling it with all files with the Java extension, install the Java language server and then process it as such though. So we want to make sure that you all have that with Visual Studio Code. If not, it's not a training smash, you can always work command line, which is an important thing to remember though. If you're not familiar with the command line or get, I think it's time to get yourself a little bit more uh, comfortable with that though. So what we're going to do, we're going to check that you have an extension loaded. Now I've got a few extensions, because Visual Studio Code is uh, a bit picky, but the one extension that you really want here is from Microsoft, which is the Java extension pack. So you want to install the Java extension pack, and that will install two extensions, actually, language support and debugging support. So we're going to do that. We're going to install the Java extension pack, and then we're going to hopefully be able to execute our code there. So if you go into search for extensions, just type in there Java extension, extension pack. And then you're going to actually install it and then restart Visual Studio Code. So let's all do that. Once you've done that, then you should be able to actually debug and run and execute Java projects in Visual Studio Code. If you can't, there is a problem with your environment. We're going to actually show you how to do it command line also via the integrated terminal. So you can do all the labs via the, the process, but you'll just have to run Maven via command line via the integrated terminal. Okay. So we're going to install the Java extension pack, and that's published by Microsoft, actually, which is, you know, if you know the, the old school Microsoft that I used to know, now that they're doing this, is very gracious of them. Okay, so you've got the Java extension pack installed, 
And then the next thing that you're going to do, you've got the projects on your desktop, the, uh, the Spring Guides. So you've all got the Spring Guides on your desktop. It's under UFS uh, Spring Training. And you've got those four guides there. So the guides you should have is accessing data with JPA, CRUD with Varden, which we're not going to go through today, serving web content, and then Spring Boot. Okay, so the first one that we're going to do, the first lab we're going to do, we're going to do it together. We're going to go through first the, uh, the overview of what you're uh, importing, and then secondly, we're going to actually execute and go through the steps one by one. So, where is this lab, you say? If you are on the GitHub repo, you'll see that the first instruction that says to you in getting you familiar with Visual, uh, Visual Studio Code, you can actually go to the Spring Boot uh, Getting Started, and that is the lab. So if you open the URL, please, in your browser, and we're going to start on that. I'm going to put it up nice and big. That's the URL. So open that URL in your Chrome browser. I know you guys like Edge, which is weird, but um, we're going to stick to Chrome. So you open that there, and that is the start of the what they recommend of the guides that we're going to go through. Okay, so just give me some kind of indication so uh, that you guys are on track. No one's we haven't lost you yet. Okay, my lovely assistants will assist in the um, dissemination of Java goodness to your. Careers. Okay, so we've opened up the that guide. There. Remember, you can actually access that page also via the GitHub page there, and this is the page that we're going to go through. There are about 80 spring guides. They're all well kept. They're up to date. And if you want to learn Spring and Java, this is a great way. We train this at DVD, um, and it's the industry standard. Even Microsoft site actually points to this guide though. Okay, so Spring Boot. When you started yesterday with Jerry's awesome boot camp, so .NET Core gave you something called dot, .NET New. Okay, a lot of systems don't have that. You're spoiled for choice in that sense because what that did, it scaffolded out an application for you with all of its dependencies. Um, we're going to do something similar except that I've cloned the repos onto your PC. So it's how to, uh, how to do this guide. So we've already cloned the repos. And now you can see here, we actually have a Spring Boot folder. Um, it's a bit small, so I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. So in your folder then, in your Spring Boot folder on your desktop, so you've got Uf UFSP, sorry, UFS Spring Train or UFS Spring Workshop. And then under that, you've got gs-springboot. So there's three folders there. Complete, initial, test, and then there's a git ignore. So the complete is the finalized solution that the guide expects you to achieve as part of the training. The initial is the starting point, which gives you just enough of a skeleton to be able to execute it without having worry about the project setup. And the test is just a, a Linux shell script, which we're not going to use to test your systems. We're going to use unit testing. So in this course, you're going to actually learn how to unit test your Spring environment. Okay, so let's look at what we have in complete, because this is the completed folder. So you've all installed the Java extension pack. So you can actually go now, if you go file, open folder, we're going to open the complete folder. So we're going to uh, select the complete folder of the GS Spring Boot. You select, select folder and it will open up. It hasn't started the language server as, as yet though. And then you're going to get a screen similar to this. If you go into the uh, Hello Controller there and click there, you'll notice that it should take a little bit of a uh, time, but it should actually start your language server. What it's also going to do is download the dependencies similar to what we did yesterday. To light mode. How do you do that? F1. Type in C. Oh, 
see. I'm changing the I used the first one that might be just good. Ah. You guys are an easy audience, so no one's complained yet. Okay, light mode. If you can't see if there's some issues and everything, if I um have lost my comedic timing, just let me know. Okay. Yeah, question. So yeah, I'm in the holding one. Okay, so we've started with the uh, our language server. So hands up if your language server was activated, if it started up. So what you've done is you've selected hello controller and the source main Java hello, and then your language server at the bottom there should have actually started up. Okay, that's basically, if that's working, you're already kind of set up. You've installed the extension pack. The uh, Java extension pack from Microsoft, and you've opened the project, the complete folder under GS Spring Boot. Remember, all of these instructions also are located on the Spring Guide. You can see here it's saying clone that repo, and then we're going to go through the next phase which is build with Maven. They recommend a different IDE on the Spring Guides. We're using Visual Studio principally because we're standardizing on that and it's an ease of use application. Okay, so what do we have here in our guide? We have a lot of files, a really large amount of files. Okay, so this is the complete folder. This is the end game of obviously what they're asking us to achieve. Remember, we're going through this slowly so you can kind of understand the rest of the guides. So the first thing you will notice, and the basic principle of any Maven-driven project, is a POM file. And POM start, stands for Project Object Model. This is the file that tells Maven what to do. It's a very important file. So you can click it, uh, click it there, and you'll see that there's a lot of XML. Do we like XML? No. We like anything but XML. We like YAML, and also people have moved over to JSON, which is the standard for configuration files, though. As Java developers, we, we hope and we pray and we pray that you know we'll get something similar. That's the URL. Okay, so our POM file. So the POM file. Okay, so the POM file has certain sections, and the sections relate to what you want to do with your project file. Maven has a certain life cycle. We're not going to focus on that as such, though, and just understand that the key life cycles, the key commands that you want to do are test and also Spring Boot run. So on your project there, if you want to run it on the terminal, if you go MVN test, it's actually going to execute Maven and run your test case. And that's going to run the built-in unit test there. The command to run everything, so actually to execute your application, it's a very simple command, uh, and you need to remember this, is MVN spring dash boot uh, boot colon run spring boot colon run now if I do maven spring boot uh, colon run what it's going to do it's going to execute similar to dotnet run your application and allow you to execute your test code and also your application so let's let's look at what this does here it's uh, saying it started up and now I can actually go localhost 8080, Java world does 8080, and it's just going to say greetings from Spring Boot. That's the application. So that's all we're going to do now for the completed folder. We're going to actually execute that. The first time you do it, it is going to run a lot of Maven commands and also download a lot, though. But your internet here is pretty awesome. We've tested that yesterday. So you're going to type in there. So the first thing, you've opened up the complete folder in uh, Visual Studio Code, you've installed the extension, 
You've opened up your, your terminal here. Uh, and I need to just close that terminal. And you've executed Spring Boot Run. So the command you're going to run on your terminal is mvn spring boot colon run. And you're going to do that from the root of your complete folder. Once you do that, if, uh, it's going to download all the dependencies that Maven requires. And that might take probably about five minutes on your initial download. And it puts it into a Maven repository, which is local on your PC, though. So ideally, once you've run it, it's not going to do it again, and it keeps a shallow copy of those files, though. Once you've done Spring Boot Run, you can go to your uh, Chrome browser and type in localhost colon 80, and you'll get greeting from Spring Boot. Once we've done that, we can ascertain that your environments are working, and also your Visual Studio code is working. No, no, not, nothing, not even a little bit. Okay, so we need to get to this point to be able to enable you for the Spring Boot uh, Labs, though, so we're going to walk around and see exactly what you guys are experiencing. No, so the plugin that you need to do is the Java extension. Some of you need to run this command before Spring Boot runs. So that's Maven install and then run Maven Spring Boot Run, and that will fix some of the problems that we're experiencing. Okay, so once you have done Maven install and Spring Boot colon run, you're going to go to localhost 8080. So localhost 8080. And then you'll get the greetings from Spring Boot. Okay, so my lovely assistants are walking around to help you. Um, it's important to understand you're not in an IDT. I think a lot of you now realize that you've been spoiled for Visual Studio. You're in charge of the editing now, <laughs> not someone else. So if you're working on the wrong folder, it's not going to work. So it's quite important that when you go into Visual Studio Code to open the complete folder right now because we're working through it and not higher or lower in the actual directory structure. Okay, so what do we have here? So let's go through the guide and then we'll go step by step on exactly what we have here. So if you uh, want to just take this down, you're going to do maven install and then maven spring dash boot colon run and then you're going to go to localhost 8080. If that's working, your environments are set up, your extension pack is working, maven's working, java's working and spring is working, which is important for us to understand to iron out any environmental issues. Okay, so now let's learn how to code. Um, so let's go through the pack, sorry, the guide, and then we'll see exactly what we've done. So when you build with Maven, so can everyone see that's pretty small? Let me go bigger. Better. You guys are a very easy audience. You can't see, just tell me and then I'll make it bigger. Okay. Uh, a little bit bigger also there. So Maven has a specific folder structure that it uses, and you'll see there that it's created a um, main Java hello application and hello controller. Remember, this is the end game for the guide. So in this, the Spring Boot, then you have your group ID, architect, uh, artifact ID, and version, and those are something called coordinates. It tells Maven exactly what your project structure is supposed to look like and what your project's name is, though. We have a parent there, 
and that parent is the Spring Boot starter parent. Very important. These are what we call parent Maven projects, and they give us capabilities to run certain features inside Maven. There are multiple of them. Uh, there are starter parent. There's also, you see here, we're going to use and depend on starter web. So the Spring Boot project there, it creates a base, uh, basic RESTful service, and then also creates a web server, a self-hosted web server for you. So we're going to tell them, hey, please use that as a parent, the starter parent. And then next, actually go and create a dependency for us that we can actually use the features of a standard Spring Boot web server. So Spring Boot starts a web. We're going to tell it to use version Java 1.8. And then we're also going to say, hey, Spring Boot has a specific life cycle. The life cycle is on startup, execution, and completion. Maven has a specific life cycle. We've already seen there, we did an install and a Spring Boot colon run. We want to tie the two together to be able to allow Spring Boot to know when Maven is closed and Maven to know when Spring Boot has closed though. Else what happens is that you execute the Maven command without this and Spring won't close or vice versa, Maven won't close. And that plugin there um, is allowing us to link the two life cycles. A lot of the time that we encounter developers who are a bit overwhelmed with Java, it's because of the different life cycles of the different technologies though. There are about 15 different life cycles in different technologies though, and we spend a lot of time just showing you how to actually understand the life cycle and use the tools to tie them in. Okay, so we're going to do the um, build with RDE, we're going to skip that, and then we're going to actually look at the first step. So you can actually do this yourself also, we're not going to do the step-by-step -step one with this one, the JPA one we're going to do together, and then after that I'm going to give you an opportunity to do one by yourself. Yeah, playing with the big boys now. Okay, so. The first thing that we're going to create, or we have created, is a hello controller.java. So hello controller is our base MVC controller. We touched on a lot of MVC yesterday, and it follows a very similar pattern as is you have an annotation at the top. Now Java uses the at sign for annotations, and then you have a mapping to handle your base request, your REST request. That literally is a REST service. That's how difficult REST is in most technologies. If you understand MVC and REST in a specific core language and framework, it's very similar in other frameworks. So we have our import statements, and then we also have a package statement at the top, which <laughs> package statements in Java, very important. You can't put a package or a file anywhere. It's not like namespaces in C-sharp. We're very strict, very pedantic uh, in case, naming, and folder structure. So over here with this Hello Controller, it just basically returns greetings from Spring Boot, and that will execute when we hit the root request handling of forward slash. And that's exactly what we see when we go and access localhost. 8080, that'll go to our controller, oh, I haven't started it actually, let me start it, view, uh, let's actually start from the debug console, we'll go through exactly how to debug that now, that'll start up Spring Boot, and then I should actually have When it comes along. Greetings from Spring Boot. Yes. Yes, so the request mapping, and we'll go, if you come tonight, I'll show you guys how to actually write your own request mapping. Um, it is a way to actually say, uh, where are we here? Here's a URL, so we've got no URL as such though, and um, map this to a root. 
So you did routes yesterday when you did the um, customer route. So that's the exact same principle in that. Okay, so the class is flagged as a REST controller, and that basically tells Spring that you want to use those features. Spring is a heavily aspect orientated framework. If you've done any aspect orientation, it's basically uh, being able to inject different objects and runtime based on the specialization that your object requires based on your qualification. So aspect orientation is uh, a different paradigm to object orientation, your normal imperative, and then also your functional programming. We're going to go through tonight also when we do the community event exactly all the different paradigms. Okay, so forward slash maps to the index method, and then they're going to expect you to create a application.java. So jar, uh, Spring is bootstrapped. Bootstrap means that when you execute a command, it is going to load a version of itself, a context of itself, into memory. So how do we do that? So let's stop this here. And then we have a, you can access it, an application.java. Application.java, if you see here, has a Spring application run. And we have another annotation at the top there called Spring Boot Application. So this is bootstrapping the application. .NET also has similar functionality. And we'll see how Node and Angular also can do it, though. Once you run that, then you can actually execute the application. And then we also have just a very basic, um, what we call command line runner there, that is going to just print out the names of all of the services that Spring has run. So if you see here on my um, output for my, when I executed Spring Boot Run, it's actually telling me, hey, I've run through all of the classes that you have here, and these are the things that we're running as part of the Spring uh, application. Now, we should actually see our own being there. So if we see here, we should actually find towards the end our own application. Somewhere in this mishmash, there is a uh, controller here, though. So let's look at exactly how to debug the application, and let's confirm if your applications are set up for debugging. OK, so as part of the extension pack, it includes debugging functionality. Um, you've seen how to execute this on command line. I'm just going to can that to make sure it's done. It seems to be closed. Okay, terminal. So you're going to open up the little debug option there. And you won't have any debug options. Remember, you're working on the complete folder. You won't have any debug options there. If you have a debug option, then something's not too great. Okay, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to say, uh, drop down there and go add configuration. We did this yesterday as part of the .NET configurations. We're going to go add configuration and it's going to say, uh, it's going to give us an option to actually add, you guys will get it, uh, add configuration. Is it broken? Your feedback and stuff. Or it doesn't look Can you do that? No, it doesn't matter. Okay. And then you're going to go and create a uh, so mine's giving me some trouble today. You're going to go and add one in Java. So add configuration. And then you'll have a Java uh, option there. For some reason, mine is not behaving. And I've got attached remote program and launch program. But when I did that, it's not actually going to do that. So once you've done that, you'll get this. Which is going to actually launch the Hello application Maybe you can do this via command line if yours isn't behaving. It's 
right? Okay, so let me just finish this and get them that, and then I'll do that. Okay, so then you should be able to, so drop down there on debug, add configuration, specify your Java option there. It will create that uh, launch.json, and then you should be able to debug it actually inside your IDE, your code editor. And then we'll start up there. Remember, this is an alternative to run by command line. If you are having problems, we can still run Maven Spring Boot colon run as part of command line. So let's get all that running. And then make sure that, please, if you're going to use the debugger there and if it's working, you close the other process you previously run. A lot of you are going to have some port conflicts, principally because you've started up your application, forgot to close it, and then you started up another application, and they're vying for the ports. Another way to see if you want to close the application, if you've got it running, you can close Visual Studio Code, and then you can also look in Task Manager and see if you have an errant Java process running. I can go down here. I don't have any Java process running, and then I can say, okay, I don't have a port conflict. Let me start up Visual Studio Code again. So let's get that running, and I'm going to come around and just make sure all of you are executing. Now, you can put a debug point at any point. So if I put a debug point there, and I actually debug it, it should actually pause on that point, and then I can access that and debug it like a standard uh, IDE editor. So let's hopefully, let's, this is going to run. And now this will only actually hook into that debug point once I've actually executed the index page. So it's starting up there. And now I should be able to go to my local host and it should actually then debug. See, it's, it's telling me, yes, you debug. And it, now it's got a different icon there and now I'm debugging in Visual Studio Code in a Spring Boot application using Java. So then I can step over, step into your classic debug features as part of your, your IDE experience. So we're going to stop that and take that breakpoint off. Remember, you can still use your terminal. You just don't have the ability to debug. You would have to, I would have to teach you how to remote and attach onto a process. So if, as long as your Maven Spring Boot runs via command line, so we're not actually going to do the launch via Visual Studio Code, we're actually just going to use the integrated terminal. Okay, so we're going to work in command line to mitigate some environmental issues. So let's carry on actually through the guard. So Spring Boot run, and that's going to bootstrap your application and execute your Spring Boot context. We've also got a command line runner there, and that enables you to execute commands based on uh, the execution of your application. You also see here that it has an annotation called bean. And Bean basically says, inject this object into Spring Boot. So that's all you have to do to create an object in memory in Spring Boot, and you're going to inject this into Spring Boot. Okay, so the Spring Boot application, the annotation, is actually called a convenience annotation, main, meaning that it's a higher level annotation. There are about 150, 160 different annotations in Spring, and Spring Boot application also includes configuration, Enable auto configuration, enable MVC, and component scan. So it's basically a super annotation that allows you to just create an application without having to worry about all of the other uh, annotations. So we've already executed. There is another way you can execute the application, which we're not going to go through, but you can also execute the application via a jar file. And that's a self contained Java archive. So if you wanted to give someone your application, you wouldn't give them the project, you would actually give them the compiled source code as part of your JAR file. You guys actually have a JAR file. Uh, it's actually located under target, and you'll see there that Spring Boot .jar. Maven builds that for you as part of the Maven install uh, lifecycle. So let's carry on. 
So when we execute the command line runner, we'll scan through our beans and also see that's the, the bean that you have there, application. And it will then execute and start up a uh, web server. Let's look at unit testing. Remember, this is just me going through slowly to check your environments. We're going to do the other lab, the next lab, step by step together. You're going to uh, code it, and then we're going to give you one an opportunity to do a lab on your own. So in one of the actual uh, dependencies for Maven, so let's go to the complete folder here, and we should have a Spring Boot Starter Test. That will add the ability for your project to use unit testing. Now, Spring is a very much a unit testing enabled framework, and it allows you to mock out certain features where necessary. So if you've done any unit testing, tomorrow we're going to do ping pong TDD, but unit testing is part of your testing strategy. It forms part of your testing strategy along with integration testing, mock testing, and also end-to-end um, -end testing. So adding that dependency there will give us the ability to actually create unit tests. In this example here, your tests are located under source test, and we've got two tests there, hello controller integration test and hello controller test. Uh, the first test we're going to look at is hello controller test, so we're going to go to Hello Controller Test there. And you'll see there that it has a lot of other annotations. First annotation we see there is run with spring runner.class. You guys have actually used other runners. .NET has something called uh, an in-unit runner. And if you've done any unit testing, runners are basically what you execute your tests in the sandbox, and they'll give you your results. So if we go into our complete folder via command line, so I'm going to actually use git here, so via your command line there, and I go mvn test, that's going to execute my runner, and also it's going to pick up all the test cases I have there, and give me some kind of indication to whether it, the test ran successful or not. So it's going to start up actually a uh, mock version of my entire application, execute my tests, and then I get test run one and the green build success. So you can uh, execute that now on your terminal. So you can either add a, a git bash terminal, but I think you guys only have access to this terminal. And then you can just type in there mvn test, and that's going to execute. Now you're doing this in the complete folder, the root of the complete folder. A lot of you were way off in your other folders. And then you'll get the, at the end of it, it's going to create a uh, mock version of your Spring application. And then it's going to give you a nice green indication to say, yes, your test did run. We only have uh, one test that ran. So let's just see exactly what ran. You can see test run there one. And I ran hello controller test. So let's see what we ran. So you've typed in Maven test, you've executed your test cases. So we ran the runner, which is the Maven test. And we have another annotation, and this is one of those convenience application, Spring Boot test. And what that's going to do, it's going to create a instance of your uh, application for you to test against. Very important. A lot of old school tests, you have to have a working uh, copy of your application and then you would start it up, and then you would execute your tests against it. With Maven, we embed the entire application inside our tests. It's pretty nifty. And then we also have a auto-configure mock MVC annotation. What that's going to do, it's going to give us the ability to mock out certain behaviors of our application where necessary. What if your application has a root, and we want to test if you go there, and you're not supposed to go there. You should get an error, correct? But that's not going to exist in your application unless you actually add the mock behavior. Mocking is also one of the different types of tests you can do, along with spars, falses, um, and stubs. So the nice thing, if this does work, 
is that you can actually execute these tests inside Visual Studio Code. So I have the run test there. I think this is part of the base extension, so I can click on that. We're not going to focus too much on that. And then if I click on run test, Wait until it finishes. Right, let's go there. Debug. It really does not want to run that test. Okay, Visual Studio Code. But you can actually run the test internal to that. We're not going to actually run it. So as long as you have access to the terminal, you can actually go MVN test. Now, I'm a big fan of command line. You've already seen here that how we've experienced some issues with a code editor, not an IDE. So imagine if we had actually introduced you a full-on IDE, though. So as long as Maven test runs and it executes, then you have the ability to write unit tests. So let's go back there. So what does this test actually do? The first thing, and very important, we want to tell it that this is a test method. So we annotate uh, a test there. In, uh, in .NET world, you would actually not use annotations. You would use something like that. And then we have a test method there called get hello. It can be called anything as such, though. And what that does, it actually uh, mocks out a request and says that when you get forward slash there, make sure that what you're getting the result from is actually greetings from Spring Boot. That looks exactly like our actual REST controller, if you remember. And we're mocking it out, so we're saying, mock MVC request builders, get the forward slash, and we're gonna make sure we get JSON back, and expect that it's okay, and also expect that the string that we're testing is equal to greetings from Spring Boot. So your application doesn't have to be actually running. We're mocking out the behavior, and we're executing it and validating that the results are correct. Okay, so you should all be able to run Maven tests from command line. If not, give me a sign, and I'll come around and help you out there. So you're actually just typing in there, MVN test, and you'll execute your life cycle and start up a embedded version, a mocked up version of your application, and then execute your tests. And you should get a nice green, yay, everything's working. So we've gone through the actual mocks, and you can go through the explanation there. I've gone through that. And then the next one is a integration test. Can anyone tell me what the difference between an integration test and a mock test is? So we've mocked out some of the behavior, right? Is that a proper test, a real-world test? No, it's not. So what happens if we want to run a real-world test? To do that, we have to actually start up a proper version of the server and then not mock any behavior. So this, this Hello Controller RT test there, which is a uh, located there. Let's go there. So this is very similar. We have the Spring Runner the class, and then we have their Spring Boot test. Actually, start up the server, but use a randomized port. So now we're going to start the server, not part of our Maven test uh, lifecycle, but we're going to start up a proper server, and then we're going to hit that server. We're still going to use Maven to bootstrap it, though. The only difference is now it's not mocked. It's actually going to use a port. So over here, then we're going to specify the port. And that is probably the easiest explanation of dependency injection you'll ever find. So we told it up the top there, please go use a random port. Okay? So we want to use that port, or we want to get access to that port. We actually create an annotation called local server port and it instantiates our variable. Where does that actually get injected? It in gets injected at runtime. So a lot of developers that we've engaged with previously 
are very confused with aspects or aspect oriented programming because they say, no, I want you to tell me where my uh, object will be from the start and then step one, step two, and step three. So I said, no, it gets pushed in sideways. Sideways? Aspect oriented programming is basically coding horizontally, getting your objects on where you want your object uh, and relying on your annotations to inject your objects at runtime. So we've got our local server port there and our base. And then we also say, hey, listen, I need some test assistance. You're going to use templates in the, uh, the guides that we're going to do a little bit later. And one of them is the test rest template. It gives you a nice method and helper methods to be able to run and execute uh, on a rest method. We set up using a what we call a fixture and at before, and we say, please use this base URL. There's our port variable. And we're going to access it via localhost, the randomized port, and then we go at test. And the difference now is we're not mocking the behavior. We're expecting a real world example from that test case. Okay, so that's the difference between integration tests and then mock tests. You're going to be using principally through the rest of the guides mock tests. Let me close all. Okay, so what happens if I need to shut the server down? A lot of you didn't realize that you can go into your terminal control C which is an important thing to remember. So if I've got my terminal open here and I'm running and executing Spring Boot colon run, to close it, you just go Control C. In production, could I do that? Control C, I could, but I might not have access to that server. So what do I do? So you need to add something called an actuator. There are other services in other languages, and what a Spring Boot actuator does, it enables you to add production-grade services onto your application. It gives you things like health check, metrics, logging, and also the ability to shut it down. So in the, the application that we have here, if we go and look into our pom.xml, you'll see there that we have a dependency that we've added there called Spring Boot Starter Actuator. When I start up my application as part of... Um, Let me open up here. So if I go MVN spring dash boot colon run, I don't have any other processes uh, running right now. You'll see it will it will start up and it will with the actuator create endpoints for me to allow me to actually access that application's health and perform certain functions. So let's go look here, and the actuator endpoints should be listed. So there you've got your actuator endpoints. Right at the top it says there, I'm going to create loggers, autoconfig, beans, audit events, and health. So I should be able to go localhost forward slash health. So I go localhost 8080 forward slash health. Status up. So that's the actuator adding production grade services onto Spring for you out of the box. So I can also shut down the server. Don't don't shut down the server. Uh, but I can also shut down it remotely. And there's other ones. So there's audit, health. And this is a nice way to say uh, provide production grade services to your application. Okay, so that will add all of the metrics there, and there's environment health, and you can go through them. And there's also a shutdown endpoint. You guys want to see? Uh, you have to actually enable it on your properties file, so let's not actually do that. So health, and then you can access it there. And then we're not going to actually go through the jar support, because uh, Groovy, because we're Java developers. So that's the basics of the Spring Boot um, getting started guard.
We're not going to do that, God. We're going to do something a little bit more tricky. We're going to attempt to do another guide from the initials uh, section, and we're going to do a JPA guide. You guys did Entity Framework yesterday, Entity Framework Core. So JPA is the equivalent in Java land of Entity Framework Core. Okay, so you guys have um, guys and girls actually um, another folder under UFS Spring Training called Accessing Data JPA. As before, it has the similar folder structure. It has a complete and initial folder. Now we're going to go through this together, so we're going to do this together. The next guide after that, you're going to do yourself. Okay, so we've got a complete and initial, and we care a lot about the initial folder. So in your Visual Studio Code, you're going to actually now go and open the initial folder of the GS-accessing data JPA. So uh, open folder, and you're going to go through to the GS. Now it's pretty important to open just that folder. So you're going to go gs-accessing-data-jpa initial. Not the root, not the complete, the initial. And then you're going to go select folder. You're going to make sure you've stopped Spring Boot on your other process. Else I'm going to have to come to your PC and they're going to go, yeah, but it's not running, something else is running, port conflict. And I'm going to go, did you con uh, kill it? No. If you want to know if it's really dead, can Spring uh, Visual Studio Code go into your task manager, look for a Java process, and then kill it. So we have now our open editor, and it has very limited files though. We just got a, a source folder there and a POM. We've seen the POM, and that's the project object. So the, the project should run. You should be able to do Maven test or Maven install, but there's nothing in it. Okay, so we've opened up the initial folder. You should get that folder structure there. And we're looking at the pom.xml. Now we're going to do this together. And we're going to open up on here the... Uh, ooh, where's my getting started guide? You're going to open up on the next step of the guide, which is on that Maven repo, the accessing data with JPA. So you're going to access the, that URL, let me put it up for you, and we're going to go through, and this is the guide that you're going to use as part of your, the step by step. So please open that up on your URL, the HTTPS Spring.io guides GS accessing data JPA. So you've opened it up there, and it's the same kind of format as the Spring Boot Guide. So if I click through there, that's the URL, and then we get the same format as the other guide. So we've just done and explained a Spring Boot Guide. We're going to go through and we're going to do the Spring Boot Accessing J uh, Access JPA Guide. Okay. So that's that URL there. And we're going to do that. You should have that open in Chrome. We've all got, got that open in Chrome. Okay. I, I can gauge by some of the faces that you guys are like, oh, what? Okay, we're just going to open that in Chrome. Cool. So we kind of are already a master who thinks, feels like they're a master of Spring yet? No one? So you can, uh, we've downloaded, we've Git cloned, we've gone into the application, and now let's look at the Maven project. Okay, so, so they've given us a basic script. They've given us a basic Maven pr uh, project, and if we go into there, we see that we are using the Spring Boot Starter parent as our parent. And then we have three core dependencies. We use the Starter JPA, 
and then we use the starter test, which we saw in the previous project. We also are going to use an embedded database. Did we use an embedded database yesterday? So this is going to provide us with a means to actually store and persist our entities. We had two entities yesterday, customer and something else. Which entities? Customer? Courses. Customer. We only did it yesterday. Customer and courses, remember? Student. Student and courses. No customer. No customer. Yesterday. Okay, we're going to do customer today. Um, that's why I'm getting confused because it's Java and .NET at the same time. Okay, so let's go through the guide here. So I've already created the source main hello for you because I, I want to make sure that your folders are right. So you should over here say I have a source source main hello. Very important. Maven is very picky with the folder structure. If you don't get the folder structure right, ain't, it ain't going to work. Our pong here, we've already gone through it, and then we've got our embedded databases and also the... Okay, so don't worry about the repositories, so we've really kind of gone through that. So let's build it. So the first thing that we're going to do, and this is, the guides are very nifty, because you can see over here, when you want to create a file, it's got a copy to clipboard. You're going to be a bit lazy. You guys want to type this by hand? You can but you can also kind of just copy it there. So we're going to create a customer.java object inside our source main Java hello package. Okay, so your source main Java hello package, so the source main hello. So all you're going to do there is you're going to right click and go uh, new file and we're going to call that customer.java. Okay, it's blank. So we've got customer.java, we're then going to go to our guides there, and we're just going to actually just copy it. Pretty nifty. All the guides are like that. You can type it by hand, but you can just uh, type it. So I go back into my customer.java, and I just paste it in there. I save it, and it should kind of give me no complaints there, and it's also running the Java ser language server, so it's already compiled and also checked the class. So let's all do that. If you're having any difficulty, give me a shout. Okay, so it seems like there's some environmental issues, so let's run from the initial and maybe install. I think that's the problem. So on your actual command line, before you actually create the customer object, you're going to, on your terminal, run maven install. And that's going to download the necessary libraries and then you won't have that problem. So you're going to run maven install from the initial folder. So we're in the initial folder. And then you're going to do a Maven install on the initial folder. And that will download your libraries for you. That's dangerous. Okay, so we're going to come back to some path issues that we're experiencing. Um, seems to be a, a path issue some of you are experiencing with that. So under source main Java hello. Uh, yeah, so that path itself seems to be a problem. So we're going to come back to that if you are experiencing that. Yeah. So, so we have the completed version also, so we can also just check because your completed version should work, um, and then we'll check exactly your environmental issues. So in my actual class, so let's go through the actual customer there. I have the entity annotation. So we've seen that previously with. Uh, dot, dot net core and entity framework and then I define my customer class and then I generate a ID pretty important I use the annotation the generate value out, uh, ID and then I have my classic constructor and then a two string um, method pretty simple 
So this is going to, with that annotation, that entity annotation, tell me that this is a managed object, an entity managed object, similar to the students and courses objects that we did yesterday. So we're going to go back to the course there. So how do we access that object? So Spring has something similar to entity object called repositories. So a repository enables you to have basic features of your object and perform certain lifestyle uh, operations on it. Life cycle. Lifestyle is what? Not class. Yeah, I said lifestyle. Lifestyle op operations on it. Okay, so we're going to create a uh, customer repository in the same package there. I think if you're having package issues, you can use a package that works for you. And we're going to right click and go new file. And we're going to call this customer repository. Repository. And we're going to rename that, I forgot to do dot Java. Okay, so I've got the customer repository class there. And over here, we can see that this extends, and this is a base class that Spring provides called CRUD repository. And CRUD repository gives us all the fine commands and executes on the lifecycle commands. Okay, so I'm now going to copy that, and I'm going to create in my CRUD repository there the, that object. You can see in the CRUD repository, I've defined it with a generic called customer, and then I have also have a custom find command that isn't included by find by last name. You can also have find by last name and equals to not that and that. So the find, these, these actual commands here can actually be queries and be driven by queries to execute and find your objects. So understand that this is really uh, black magic because what we're doing is we're managing an object uh, and its life cycle. We're creating a repository which is going to allow us access to that object and all we've written is really two lines of code. There is a danger in ORMs. Ask any of my colleagues here around ORMs. Uh, we strongly advise, and we're, we're training them now, but we strongly advise to only use ORMs where necessary. Where is necessary? If you don't know, don't use them. So we have our customer object here with an entity annotation. And then we also have now something to manage that customer object called a customer repository. Pretty simple. There's not a lot of code in that, in those usage. So where do we use the customer repository? We're going to create an application.class. The application.class is going to call our customer repository and it's going to perform actions on customer objects. So we're going to create an application. So in our roots there, we're going to go, okay, in hello, I'm going to go new file, application, application.java. And then in here, I've got my nice guides that can allow me just to copy it over there and I'm going to paste it into there. So let's go through what we've done here. So the first thing you see, you remember that Spring Boot annotation there? That's our root annotation. What does that do? That bootstraps the application for us. It starts up an instance of the application. We created a logger, which in Java and in other languages is a terrible difficult thing. It doesn't have to be this difficult, but it is a terrible difficult thing to create loggers for some reason. And it hasn't stopped. Then logging is logging easy. Yeah, logging is easy in Java. It should be easy. It should be, yes. We create our main method, similar to uh, .NET, and you must understand that .NET tried to differentiate, differentiate itself, so it has a capital M. We have our command line runner. Do you remember when we actually did the bean interrogation? Head nods all around. Remember our command line runner? Over here, what we're doing is we're actually now command line running into our test database. So let's see if you guys can actually fathom that. That customer re repository object, where does it come from? 
We're getting a customer object as part of the command line runner. This is where developers start to freak out a little bit. That's being injected into the method as part of aspects. Because we're putting it in there, it's going to go look in memory if we can find an object of that type. It's going to instantiate it, and then it's going to inject it into that method. And you have to hope that that object actually has been instantiated and it does exist. Yeah. Yes. Sorry? MPF? So C Sharp uh, has dependency injection built in by default. The first framework that did do that was Unity. Um, so your entity objects, and also what we saw yesterday with the um, Spring MVC object, uses uh, that. I'm not too sure about MVF, though. So what is this command line runner doing? So you can see here, I now have access to my repository object, and I'm saving a new customer Jack Bauer, Chloe O'Brien, Kim Bauer, David Palmer, and Michael Dessler. These are all, I think, 24 names, 24, the main characters of 24. I never, I never really caught on to that. that it was too weird, that, that series. But the Spring Guys, they have a nice sense of humor. Okay, so now we're saving those objects. We're saying, repository, please save. Did we define that save method there? So where does it get it from? It gets it from because the customer repository actually extends CRUD repository. Then you get your create, read, update, delete uh, methods out of the box, including save. We have our save methods there, and we also have default find methods. So the next thing that we're going to do here is find all, and that's going to loop through it and also print out the objects that we've just recently saved. If we want to do a find by ID or find by last name, then you can do find one. And remember that method that we had in repository, find by last, last name? That was our method. So we created that in the customer repository. Remember that? But did we define an actual implementation there? So how does it know? Because it knows that our objects have a last name, and we're calling the method by that, so it's going to go look for that method name in that object. Also kind of black magic. But you can actually have long methods find by surname where equals to ignore case greater than x, y, z. You can have an entire process flow in your method names. So we've got our customer object, we've got our customer repository, and also we have our command line runner. So we should be able to execute this now and actually see if it is going to run. Now these are not unit tests. So we can't actually execute this as part of Maven tests. But we should be able to execute this as part of Maven install. So let's actually run that in command line here. So I'm, I'm in my initial, I've created my customer object, my customer repository object, and my application.runner. You can use plain notepad if your IDE is giving you issues right now. You can use plain notepad or notepad++. I grew up, the first applications I created for multi-billion RAM companies was with notepad. Then I grew, uh, then I had uh, textpad, which was uh, like a notepad++. And then someone gave me a copy of JBuilder back in 2001. And yeah, I've been using IDEs shamelessly ever since. So if I type in there, Maven install, what we're looking for is the application to run, to execute, to build itself, and then to also create those objects that we had there, and then to come back. It's not creating a web server. We don't have any RESTful services, and we're not creating a web server. Build failure. Uh, I've got a step. That not actually Maven there. Let's just go there. Let's run that. Okay, yes, so this is not actually bootstrapping of Maven. 
you're going to have to execute the command on the, the guard there that is actually going to run your jar file. So the jar file, the, the statement that you're going to run is that. That needs to be run from the root of your initial project. So you've done the Maven install, you've created your customer object, your customer ob uh, repository object, and also your command line runner. And now we're going to execute, we're going to say Java, execute our jar file. And you're going to execute. Remember, you can just copy that from your guide. That's towards the bottom part of the guide. So we're going to, let's type that in there. So you're going to do that as part of your initial project and you're going to type that, you can type it in, but you can also just copy that from the guide. Okay, so once you've uh, executed your uh, data dot jar, uh, your jar, then you will actually see here that it's copying and also storing those, uh, those uh, entities. We can debug it, so if you actually do a debug statement there, you can debug it and then you have to um, debug there, add a configuration, Java, come around, and then I can debug it. And then it should pause actually where we did our breakpoints. on the customer there. So with the debug you can mouse over, for example we have customer and it will give us a representation of the customer object we're trying to actually find. You can see their first name Jack, last name Bauer and you can modify those as part of a normal debugging um, tool set. So that's JPA. So what we've covered is how to create an entity, how to create a repository and how to use that repository. What I'm going to do is go through the next lab with you also because of the environment issues and make sure that you guys grasp the concepts and then we're going to do the final lab where we actually merge the two and do similar to what Jerry did where we can create a uh, web interface to access our JPA objects. We still have pretty much a lot of time so we can actually do that. So we're going to close that those projects and we're going to open the, the next project which is the serving web content. We're going to open up the initial and we're going to execute this. So we've opened up the initial of the serving web content. We're going to go through the basics of WebMVC, very similar to the controllers of the .NET Core MVC. Okay, so the guard we're going to be using is located, uh, let's just go here, under that URL. So you're going to open up that URL here and GS serving web content. Okay, so let's open up JS Serving Web Content. And what we're going to build is similar to the REST controller for greeting, except we're going to do this with HTML pages. So if you remember the Spring Boot application, do you remember what it, it gave us as a greeting? That was via a REST controller. So we're going to do something similar, except we're going to also pass in a variable, a request parameter, a name, and we're going to call it whatever the name that you want. So let's look at the 
Let's get the completed working here. So I'm actually going to open up the completed to show you what the end result is. So open folder, complete. And I preset this up so I should actually just go into my uh, debug and I can just start it up. And then we'll access the web controller and say our hello greeting. Let's start it up. So now I should be able to go localhost AD80 and it has a get your greeting here and that's going to actually put in the name of the greeting that I have and it's going to say hello world. So if we go get your greeting here we want to actually see it put in name equals to user pass it in a request parameter and it's going to say hello user. So that's the basic of what we're going to build and what the end result is though. So that's the completed. Remember you can do this also yourself um, in your own time with the guides. You have the completed and the initial. The completed is the end result and the initial is the starting off primarily to get you started off with Maven. So let's remember to stop that and go and open up the initial folder of the GS serving web content. Okay, so are we Maven geniuses yet? Well, we know that it does a lot. We know that it helps us build the application and we know that it has a, a lot of nice plugins which makes our lives easier. Okay, because if, if I had to write this by hand with Spring, it would be nigh impossible. These nice little parent projects there in boot starter packs, they're gifts from the gods. So the first thing that we're going to see in our initial project is that it is a, a child, so it inherits from the boot starter project. If you want to build your own, you can. So there's a very nice site that will actually let you build your own, and that's called uh, start.spring.io. So you can actually build the entire uh, Maven project there. So for example here, I want to actually say, let me say web, give me a Maven file with web, and it'll say select uh, the dependency, JPA, that we just did now, JPA, and now I can go generate my project, and it'll create a demo.zip, including in that is the uh, Maven and also the source files that you can actually start a project on. So I've got main, Java, and it will have all of the source files. So this is start.spring.io. It enables you to build exactly what we have in our complete and initial folders from scratch, but you need to understand what your dependencies are. We have two dependencies there, uh, web and JPA, and that's very similar to what we're doing later when we actually mix the two together. When we have the JPA uh, customer repository, and we want to display that in a web context. You guys want to take a 10 minute break? You're very, very gracious that you don't complain about breaks though. Usually the smokers start to get edgy and they start to actually get, you know, Rory just kind of, let's go for a break. No break? You're fine? Okay. Let's look at the guide. Okay, so. We're going to build with Maven. So there is an alternative build tool. You'll see it in the guide there. It's called Gradle. You guys know Android? You've heard of Android? So Android is a Java similar environment. I say Java similar because it's not Java. Remember that whole big hunabaloo between Microsoft and Google? The reason is because they copied Java. Android Java doesn't run using the same tooling. It runs using the same syntax and the same language, but it's not the same tools. It's a rendition, a white labeling of Java that Google took. Groovy and Gradle are languages and tools that Android used uh, because it was an opinionated take on exactly what they wanted to do. Gradle works in a very similar way, except if I show you the, the syntax here, a Gradle file 
is written in a different syntax similar to JSON. It's not actually written in XML. If you understand Maven, you understand Gradle. They're very similar as such, though. If you want to learn Android development, you need to understand uh, Gradle. So this guide actually goes through both. It goes through Maven and also Gradle. We're going to do Maven, because Maven's always been good to us, right? No, not even... Uh, So we're serving the web project, and the first thing that we need to do is make sure that our projects actually have the correct folder. Um, I don't mean the initial. Okay, so I've actually created the files for you, the application and an empty greeting controller. So source, main, Java, hello. We've already seen um, some of your PCs, they have an issue with the path. I believe what happened was when we synced the git folder to all of your PCs, so we have a syncing mechanism, it didn't sync the entire folder. So we're having some problems there that when we sync it from the central core server, it actually loses uh, communication with some of the servers and gives you partial access to those folders. You can still access these folders, these uh, the repositories, and do this again in your own time. Remember, it's on my GitHub account under Rory P forward slash UFS Spring Training. And there are, on the, uh, the main Spring Guides, over 50 guides you can actually do as part of your, your Spring experience. Okay, let's go on, carry on. So we've got our source main Java hello package, and then we've got our POM file. We're all f uh, familiar with POM. Um, I'm the wrong folder here. We've got our POM file, and now we're going to add two new starter uh, dependencies. We're going to add something called Farmleaf. You guys did Razor Pages yesterday. So Farmleaf is similar to Razor Pages, except it's written in a Java syntax. That's basically it. If you understand Razor Pages, you'll understand Farmleaf. We're also going to add Spring Boot Dev Tools, and we'll see what that enables us to do. And that will give us, similar to what the actuator, it will give us the ability to act on our web server. Not only the Spring application, but on our web server as such, though. So between actuator and DevTools, you have full access over the self-hosted application web server. And then we have our uh, Java version, and then Spring Boot Maven plugin. Remember, Spring runs in the last cycle, Maven runs in the last cycle, and also JUnit runs in the last cycle. Trying to manage those yourself is very difficult. We need a tool like the Spring Boot Maven plugin to be able to do that. So let's build this here. First thing we're going to do, we're going to create a web controller. We're going to call this greeting controller, and we're going to put it under source main Java, hello greeting controller.java. So I'm going to copy that, and I've already created it before, and I've got a greeting controller.java. I'm going to paste the code in there, and it's a very similar controller. What is the difference between this controller and the REST controller? Really just the name. The first example that we did when we were getting your environments up, we called it at the annotation REST controller. So that will actually get us a few new features that are REST specific. Here we don't care about REST, so we're going to use the controller syntax. Similar to the REST controller, we're going to create a request mapping to greeting. And then basically all we're going to do there is say, when you get a greeting, look for a parameter inside the um, request called name. When we did this here, if you remember the end result, we actually said greeting question mark name equals to user, and that's a get parameter. Remember REST uses get push, uh, sorry, get post um, patch options and um, oh, this is one more I can't remember. So it uses the HTTP verbs just to send data over uh, to the REST controller. With, with uh, HTTP, we only really use GET and POST, and we're going to use GET here, and because we've actually added that into a parameter, uh, the name equals to user parameter there. Okay, so our greeting controller here, we've got our 
request parameter. And pretty important, you guys saw with Razor Pages, when you returned the view, what did you give it? You gave it your model. So the model here, it's a little bit easier. Um, we actually saying model, and we get that model there from passed into there, and we say model just basically return the name there. We don't have to add, like in Razor Pages, the secret form hidden variable, um, and we have direct access to our model. We don't have to return the view with that model. Okay, so how are we going to display this? Similar to the Razor Pages, we're going to actually write a farm leaf web page. Farmleaf is very specific, uh, it, it attempts to make HTML easy, so it doesn't overburden the HTML with specific uh, Java tags as such though. So we're going to create a file called under source main resources templates greeting.html. If you go into your, so source main resources, and I've already created it for you called greeting.html, it's empty there. So you should be able to actually go and just paste in the HTML code there. And that's going to give us our greeting. So let's look at what we did here. I created greeting.html. And over here I have a P tag. You used uh, different tags in razor pages and one of them was the variable tags in time the p tag basically says this is a variable that you this is an output and we say p tab it's text hello and we're going to say the name so where does it get the name there the model remember in the greeting controller here we actually returned back the name as uh, and bound it to the model So we've got our greeting.html, and we've saved it. So we don't, we can't actually execute this right now. We still have to do a few steps, and now we're going to make it executable. We just need a basic Bootstrap application now. So if you d remember from before, we're going to actually go into our source main hello. I've created an application that Java for you, and now we're going to just create a bootstrap and that's going to start up our application once we do that we should be able to execute our application from the spring boot maven command line we can also do it via the jar file so let's try spring boot maven um, close that And now I'm going into the initial folder, so cd, let me make it bigger, cd, gs, serving, web content, cd, initial, and then I want to do maven, spring, boot, colon, run. So if that doesn't work, we can also try it with the jar command. So it's first going to download, remember we added those dependencies, it found them. It's going to attach our actuator, and now it's actually said, map the greeting URL to that. So let's, let's try access that now. So we should be able to go greeting. Ooh does not like that. Let's try localhost. I think we're jumping ahead a little bit here. Okay, so it does not like the Spring Boot Maven plugin. Let's actually execute this with what they recommend, which is the Java jar. So 
Let's execute that. Uh, oh, may have been install, that's why. Okay, so let's execute that. Uh, doesn't like that actual file, that's why. So I actually, so they used the Gradle commands also, and I took the Gradle command. That was the problem. So let's cancel that. I've done Maven install, and now I'm executing. So this is going to start up our application, and ideally now it's going to actually bind. Hmm. It's saying there is a service already on that port. So this is what I told you about. So I haven't killed actually one of my processes. I need to go and find that process, that errant process, and kill it. So an easy way to do that is to go into Task Manager to find any commands, any processes that are running uh, java.exe and see we found it. So I forgot to kill my Spring Boot application. So I found it there. It's a Java process. So I can actually just go and end task. And now I can execute that. And that's probably also why the Spring Boot uh, Maven run wasn't executing. So this will bootstrap it. It will attempt to uh, bind into port 8080 and should create the greeting. So that was quick. Um, and if you see here, there should be a greeting map here. Let's try. Hmm. Still no. I think I may have step, missed out a step. So the nice thing about the complete the web content and the complete initials, I can actually do a comparison between the two to see which step isn't working. So I've got a nice little comparison tool there. So I can go into my source, main, Java, hello. That's fine. Thanks. Okay, so it seems like I didn't actually create my greeting controller which is pretty weird because I've got Geek Green Controller there. I didn't save it. <laughs> Yay! Problem solved. But it does show, go to show that you can actually do a comparison between the two of them. Um, so this is beyond compare. But you can also do a comparison inside Visual Studio Code and other tools though. So we couldn't find my greeting controller. I did a comparison between the complete in the initial, and I realized that I hadn't actually saved on the complete. So now we can actually go back <laughs> and recover and see exactly. So we're going to execute that. And now it should, we should see the binding of that greeting controller on startup. OK, so let's look at our greeting controller. Wow, okay. Let's go back there. Oh, I know. Uh, I didn't do Maven install. NVN install. NVN install.
Okay, so let's now try MVN uh, target. So we rebuilt our jar file, our executable, and now we're going to see if our beating controller now is there. And there, so now we've got it. So remember, if you miss out a step in the Maven lifecycle, we didn't rebuild our object. So two problems that I've seen now. One is that I didn't save all, and two is that I didn't rebuild the jar file to be able to have the binding there. So if I have the binding there, I should have localhost 8080 forward slash greeting. And it's going to say hello world. Okay, yeah, I've got, wow, this is a big Red Bull. Pretty, pretty massive. Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm going to paste this. Okay, so this is not the full working uh, copy, if you remember, because we, what we had was question mark, name equals to user. We don't want to say hello world, we want to say hello, we don't want to say hello uh, user, we want to say hello Rory. Hello Rory. So what that's doing, if you remember, it's taking a request parameter in from the request object, putting it into our model, and then forwarding it to our time leaf page, and so we can actually access that object. That's the simple part. Behind it is the Maven project lifecycle, the dependencies you have to add, and then we've also seen some difficulty to get your RDE to acknowledge those dependencies though. But I'm working off the command line right now. I've abandoned the RDE. Okay, so let's see here. So we created our web controller, our request mapping. Now let's look at, someone asked me today, how do we enable hot swapping? Can Maven do that in hot swapping, right? So I think it was someone there. So how do I make a change and then hot swap it? The previous one with JPA, you couldn't do that. But with this, we've enabled DevTools. DevTools is a way for you to hot swap your application out, make changes to it, and it won't have to require you to do this Maven install, jar this jar, all of these lifecycle hooks that kind of stop you from doing what we want to do. We want to write code. So we've added the dev tools. So I've added it for you previously. And that the dependency there is Maven Spring Boot dev tools. And dev tools will give you the ability to hot swap. So how do we test that as such though? You can actually make a small little uh, change. So we've done the Spring Boot application. Application.java. Spring run. Okay, so let's let's make a small change. Uh, we're going to actually put in here, let's test it if they, they're true to their word. So we've got Spring Boot there, we've got the DevTools enabled. Now we want to actually create Greeting Controller. We want to make a change here. And we're going to say uh, name, add attribute name, name. And we're going to return name plus hello. I'll save all. Now this should actually hot swap it in there and we should on our command line, it should tell us that you it is hot swapping there out. So if I go back there and I do name it to Rory, it should have the endpoint there. I'm holding thumbs. Because we were actually starting this with java-jar. No, so it didn't actually work. So it's not actually hot swapping. I'm not going to lose face over that. We, 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 we have nice tools once in a while. Okay. So that's the actual uh, end. We want to do one more thing though. We just want to give them a home page. So we want to create an index.html. 
So we're going to create a uh, source main resources under static, and we're going to create an index relation with source main resources. We're going to create a new folder called static, and then a new file called index.html. Paste it on there, and then that will give us the ability to have a forwarding. So we're going to do maven install. just to build our jar file and then maven uh, java-jar the serving web contents dot jar so if you see here there's a a tag and that a tag is going to forward it to the greeting you can also put parameters in that a tag So my spring has started up, and now I can actually go to the roots of my project, index.html, and if I wanted to, I can click through there and go to my greeting, which will say, hello world. Oh, there it is. Do you remember that? Java. So that was the hot swapping that I wanted to do. Okay, so... Let's summarize what we, we saw today. So in the beginning of God's creating the world, in the beginning of the Spring Boot application, we saw creating a very basic REST controller. And we annotated that with at REST controller. Very similar to MVC controller, except that you'd use a different annotation. We then created a, a JPA entity object, customer, and we used the customer repository to be able to act on that entity object. We added some entities and we uh, saved them and then we re went and retrieved them and we found them. The latest layer that we did there, we used Farmleaf, so we created a controller, we acted on the model of that controller and then we performed functions that returned that model and we displayed that using basic HTML syntax. Okay, we're all on board. So how do we actually bring these two together? We still have plenty of time, which means I can run a, another lab after this, a little bit of a fancier lab. So, let's look at how to bring these all together. Because what we want to do is actually print out the customer names based on a Farmleaf template. So that's not actually part of the guides. So we've done three guides. The getting started with REST, which is the Spring Boot one, the JPA one, and the web ones. So let's look at this now, Spring. Important to close your Spring projects. So what I've created here is the exact same as we did before. So we have a customer object, if you remember the customer object there, and it is an entity. It has some base properties. And then we have a customer repository. So remember that? We did that just a second ago. I also have just a basic HTML page there, a home.html, which is going to render our pages. So this project, the solution to this project, is actually located on my GitHub account under Spring MVC Lab. So this is the solution. So you can actually access that. Um, and this is not got a complete or initial. If you guys want to clone that, that's the location there. And that is going to take the two labs that we did, the MVC and also the JPA ones, and create a uh, HTML rendition of 
the web page. Okay, so let's go through it. We have our customer repository, we're familiar with that. It extends CRUD repository. We have our customer object also. And then we have also our customer controller. So we just did customer, uh, we just did controller as part of the uh, timely one. And who can spot the difference between this and the, the uh, greeting controller? There's really only one difference. What we do there is we're injecting that repo uh, repository. So if you remember there, and we're saying at resource customer repository, where does it get the repository from if it doesn't exist? Over there on the sideways. There's a whole little ether land there called aspect land that it actually will go, if it doesn't have uh, found it, it will go create it. New is dead. Uh, object, the name of the object equals to new object, it's dead. The factory pattern of yesterday is kind of like old school. So this is how you create new objects. If I want to create a new object, if that object doesn't exist, it's going to be created for me. And that object there is a customer repository object. And also when I use that object there, I can use all of the farm commands. So I'm going to go, please add into my model. We saw that we can access our model. Customers as collection and find all. So we're going to add a listing of our customers there into our model object and return it to a page. When we return it to a page, then we're going to be able to access that as part of our model. That's all you need to do to tie in the two technologies, web and repository. It needs, the web needs to know where your repository is found and also that it has a repository object. So on the HTML page, we're going to display our customers in our database. So for each of the customers, and this is a nice, uh, Jerry did this also, you're looping through the objects in the list. You guys did list courses. Yeah, you did list courses yesterday. So it's a very similar structure as such though. We're going to list through the customer's connection, and then we're just going to display the first name of those customers. So you can see now, if you know .NET Core, Spring Follow Suit, it's a very similar paradigm. And my colleague uh, Michael is going to show you that very similar concepts can be used with Angular. It's not that difficult then if you understand the core concepts of what is a MVC controller, what is a REST controller, what is a repository, and what is an entity. And they're interchangeable across all the different technologies and all the different frameworks. So we're going to now run this. So the first thing we do need to do is we need to add some uh, data in there. And you can see there we've got that command line runner. And that's going to actually add data into our database. So let's. Uh, execute this. Let me go into the folder. Remember this is located, the solution for this, under the Spring MVC lab, if you guys want to take that down. And then I'm going to go Maven for this one. I know it will work. Spring. Let me go Maven install first. Maven install is going to build all of my dependencies. And then I'm going to do Maven spring dash boot colon run. That's executing my tests. So let's go maven spring dash boot colon run. So what this will do, it will load my data into my database. It will start a web server up. I haven't added actuator or dev tools. Um, 
Let me just check there. I put actuator.devtools in my pom.xml. Okay, I do have dev tools. I have dev tools, but not actuator. So it started up and it's going to link that to uh, home. So I can go localhost colon 8080 and then forward slash home. And why is it forward slash home? Because in our controller that we did here, the customer controller, we did a request mapping of forward slash home. And it should actually now pull the, the data entries from the database and then display them on our page. So yeah, remember those are the entities that we let, we loaded with the command line runner. When we did in the previous exercise, we added Jack and Chloe and Kim and David and Michael. And then this is the customers in the database. So we're injecting the repository into our controller. If it didn't exist, it's going to exist. And that's a very concept, uh, it's a very uh, important concept to understand. If the object didn't exist prior, it will exist. You just have to hope it does though. How do we test? We test using the test integration tests and also the test mock tests. So we test the mock, the behavior, we test the boundary conditions and also the, the, the actual test cases that we want to do. And then we use with our integration tests to do real world tests to spin up a, a proper copy of the database and system and then to test against the system. Okay, so we have some uh, more time. I think we're going to finish Mark, we're scheduled to finish at 1. Uh, 12. 12. Okay, so we only have 15 minutes. I wanted to show you the last one. You can actually do it on your own. Uh, the last one that we have on the um, MBC, the lab, is Varden. And Varden, anyone heard of GWT? Google Web Toolkits? So, Varden, if I can just briefly show you this. It's a dark time in our history. It's still dark. Java's still dark. So Varden basically allows you to create an application programmatically. No HTML. So if I go into my project, Spring, and that's the Varden. So you guys can actually do that. I'm going to open up the completed folder there and just show you the end results then. So Varden is a nice way to say, hey guys, listen, I don't want to do HTML at all in any way. I don't understand it, I don't have access to it, I don't want to do it. So how do I create a full functional website just with Java? The same can be said, you can do the same with .NET. The JavaScript is the web, so you can just create with that. So let's look at exactly what that does. And I don't have any actual web pages here, I just have my application. So I've got my hello package, my customer repository, um, and then I have a Varden UI. And then this Varden UI, you'll see there uh, in it, I create a programmatic representation of my website. I create views, so horizontal layout, vertical layouts, set the grid, um, and then add hooks onto that to modify my customers. And this, the interesting thing about Varden and GWT is this can run as a thick client also. So a client that is your normal uh, .NET or Java client because it doesn't have any real connection to HTML. There is no HTML code. If I, if I execute this now, so this is a Varden rendition of the customers. It's going to list the customers. It's also going to give us some very basic CRUD com uh, commands to be able to access the customers. So it's building. And now I should actually be able to go localhost. And you'll see that the first thing that you'll notice is that the UI has changed. And it's got a very specific look and feel to it. Let's just wait for it to finish. I was starting it up when my other process was up. I don't even know why or how that would work then. Important to actually can your processes. So let me stop that there. And go into the application via.
So this is the GS uh, CRUD with Varden. And I'm going to actually go into the complete and then go Maven spring dash boot colon run. So what's the problem with programmatically creating a website? So what you're doing is you're rendering the website on the back end. And the front end is just a dumb copy of the HTML. When what we've seen, oof, what we've seen port 8080, ah, failed to start. Let us go find that errant process and kill it. There it is, end task. What we've seen is a move towards MVVM with Angular, with React, because the front end isn't done anymore. We can't be treating it as that. So we can't tell the front end here is the controls you need. We should only give it to data. We should give it the REST services. And tonight I'm going to show you <laughs> what's coming after REST. So <laughs> really suggest you attend the session tonight when I'll do functional reactive endpoints. I've just only shown you REST today, and now I'm going to say that it's on its way out. And then here is our Varden UI. It's going to start loading the controls. And now we've got our customer. If you want to do a new customer, so I can do their Rory Freddy, and I can save that. And I can also access that. So this I created with some controls, but accessing our customer repository, accessing the customer object, but there wasn't a line of codes written in HTML. So there are a few tools like this. But remember, this is rendered on the back end. If I had a MVVM application, it would be not able to access a lot of these tools, though. Okay, so thanks, everyone, today. Um, we're going to have a break for an hour, one hour, and then we're going to start on the Angular Bootcamp. Um, you have access to all of those re repositories, um, and also, if you want to chat to me afterwards around anything, I'm free and available. Thanks, everyone.